I have the privilege and the honor to introduce our speaker for today, Pastor Dr. Brian Biedbach, the son of our dear beloved brother Mark. Brian pastors a church in Malawi. He graduated from the Massive Seminary in 1996, went to South Africa in 1997, when he passed, where he passes the church in Johannesburg, then to Malawi, where he passes the church. I hope this is correct. Correct me later. And he teaches in a Bible college, and soon will be starting a new Bible seminary in Malawi. I know of some young people. In fact, we have a young man from Master, uh, from uh, uh, Grace Community Church uh, of John MacArthur, who sent us a letter last year saying that he's going to on a short mission trip to Malawi to meet, uh, to uh, work with uh, Pastor Brian. So I want to encourage young people, this might be your next mission trip, short mission trip to Malawi and for us also. Uh, Brian obtained his doctorate degree in theology in, uh, in 2007. Brian is married to Anita and has four children and I figured out their system. You see, Anita is A, Brian is what? B. So guess what the kids' names are? They start either with an A or with a B. So you have either Amy and Allison or Bradley and Benjamin. That's it. So we know them all. We're going to keep them in prayer. Today, it's a great privilege to welcome, having prayed for them and having prayed for Pastor Brian and expecting great blessings in our midst, Pastor Dr. Brian Biedbach. Let's give him a big round of applause, please. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here, and we we did want all the the girls to be A's and all the boys to be B's, so that the boys could always look to the girls as first. And uh, we didn't plan that uh, we would have a, a girl and two boys and a girl, so it's A B B A. It's Abba, like our Abba Father, or a Swedish rock band, if depending uh, what your uh, past is. Uh, anyway, this is a picture of our family in Malawi. This is where we've been serving. Uh, for since 2007. I originally went there in 1997, worked there till 1998, and then was down in Johannesburg where I met my wife, and we were married in, in 2000. Uh, let me see if I got this right. Okay, so this is where Malawi is. It's in Central Africa. It's a couple countries north of South Africa. It's a landlocked country. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. And uh, life in Malawi is beautiful. They have a, about a third of the country is a lake. Uh, and it's a freshwater lake. It's 365 miles from north to south, and it's 55 miles wide. So when you look out and see Catalina, it's twice the distance that Catalina is from our coast here. That's how wide the lake is. Um, but it's one of the world's poorest countries, and most people, about 12 million of the people live in villages, and uh, they are in just really, really uh, great poverty in, in Malawi. But there's a lot of happiness as well. People are quite content, uh, and uh, the gospel is wide open there. Uh, you can talk about Jesus uh, as freely as you want. And uh, we are involved in an international church that meets in the capital city. So we're not so much in the rural area. We're in the capital city, and we're on a university campus. This is the church where I pastor. It's called International uh, Bible Fellowship Church. We currently rent these facilities. This is uh, in, on the university chapel that where I teach. We use that. And we have a very international congregation as well. We're in the capital city of Malawi, and because it's one of the world's poorest countries, there are a lot of relief agencies in the capital city, and there are a lot of embassies and so forth. So a lot of international people, expatriates from all over the world, um, are there at our, uh, in our congregation. But about half of our congregation are Malawian. And uh, I'm regularly teaching just about every week when I'm there. I'm preaching God's word. And we have baptisms. We use the university pool for the baptisms. And uh, we've seen a number of people come to Christ. And I'm also involved some with uh, helping pastors to plant churches and strengthen churches. Uh, a couple of pastors I've sent helped get down to uh, South Africa for biblical training in a seminary down there. And then uh, we helped them get reestablished back in Malawi. One of the pastors' roof blew off while he was studying down in um, Malawi. That's the roof of their church. And so we. We helped them get a, a new roof on it, and then uh, that was his house, which was under construction, and so we helped them to get uh, that completed. This will give you a good idea between the, 
the rainy season and the dry season. It rain, the rainy season is about uh, three months of the year. It rains almost every day, but then it's no rain for about nine months of the year. And so um, this is where I teach the Bible. I teach at African Bible College, which is a liberal arts university in the capital city. We have about 300 students in residence. And I have the privilege of taking all of the men who are in their final year, the senior men at this university, and I take them through a one-year course in preaching. And that's really a privilege of mine to be able to do that. I'm grateful for that. And we have first-class uh, facilities there. The idea is that you would take a first-class uh, Christian college, like from America, a world-class university, and you would drop it down in a third-world country so that people could get it trained at the same standards that we have here in the States, but in a third-world country without having to leave their own country. And so uh, we, uh, m most years, we, we accept about 100 students, and we often have more than 1,000 students that apply to get in. So there's a great hunger for theological training in Malawi. Um, this is what I'm really excited about. Lord willing, next year we're going to be starting the Central African Preaching Academy. This is a, a new seminary. It's going to be a Master's of Divinity level training uh, where they learn Greek and Hebrew and all the same tools that pastors have here to be able to prepare their sermons uh, at, at the highest level. We want to give that to the Malawian people because until Malawians are trained at the same level that missionaries are trained at, they'll always be dependent on the missionaries. So I'm really excited about this. It's kind of the final stages of, of missions in, in, in a certain country. And so to see people be able to get this kind of training. And uh, here are some pictures of our family life in Malawi just to give you an idea of what it's like. We like to go on safari from time to time. We don't get to go very often, but when we do, we really enjoy it. And uh, our kids like the boat safari more than anything. There's lots of uh, water life because of the lake in Malawi, and you never know what you're going to see when you're on safari. And so uh, the kids, kids really enjoy it. You can get a lot closer in the, uh, in the boat than you can on land to elephants and things like that. So uh, there's lots of <laughs> crocodiles and, uh, and hippos. Oh, wait a minute. I got to skip <laughs> I showed this presentation last week to a youth um, to a youth uh, group, and so I put their uh, one, oh no, it's not in there. Good, okay. I thought that was going to be <laughs> all right. So I put their youth pastor in there with all the animals, but now he's he's no longer there. So okay. So another thing we like to do in Malawi is uh, we we like to uh, we, we like to explore trees. There are these baobab trees, and a lot of them are hollow inside. And so like this one, for example, you squeeze in and then like there's a picture of our family inside the tree, just like Keebler elves. And uh, we think that's pretty fun. Our kids like to find windows and little places where they can go in. So normally our kids go to a, a Christian school that's on the campus of the university where I teach and we live on the same campus. So they walk to school in the mornings. They love it. They have great freedom there. And my wife sometimes helps out in their classroom. And uh, my youngest has been staying home, but this year, Lord willing, she'll be starting school. We're really excited about that. Kids uh, love to just play in the mud. That's one of their favorite activities. It's really one of the things you ask them what they miss about Malawi. It's the dirt. There seems to be more dirt there. And uh, here's some pictures you might only find in Malawi. Here's a picture of me on top of a hippo. That uh, I didn't kill it, but I took a picture as if I had killed it. And uh, I wanted to, uh, to be able to... Uh, uh, have um, uh, I, I ate some of the meat of it? You know, they were carving it up right on the property where I was living at one stage back in 1997. So uh, it's good meat. I would recommend crock potting it if you ever make it because it's tough meat, but it's good meat. And uh, we have some unique opportunities. Our kids occasionally we get to go into villages, and so our kids get to experience a completely different culture than they normally would. And uh, our kids are fascinated by these donkey carts. They have these carts all over town. And so uh, one year for our kid's birthday, uh, we rented, uh, we hired one of the drivers of the donkey cart. Usually you can hire him to transport goods from one place to another. But we decided to have him come to our house and we decorated it and we let the kids drive the donkey cart uh, to go pick up their friends, to bring them back for the birthday party. So a bunch of missionary kids came to their party and uh, we started a whole new industry in Malawi, and that's donkey cart party rentals. Um, and uh, uh, one of the kids brought a gift for our kids. It was a, a Land Rover car made out of grass. So you just have find unique things there. And uh, now one of the things about Malawi that maybe you might not know, mice are considered a delicacy in Malawi. And it's uh, people from all different walks of life, 
like these things. They, what they do is they catch them in the, um, they catch them in the in the fields, and then they boil them and they, they gut them. And they gut them and they boil them in salt water with really a lot of salt, and then they dry them in the sun, which preserves them and it makes the uh, fur just melt in your mouth. It's uh, it's Melted. quite a. A treat there. They eat them full like this with the teeth, the whiskers, the claws, everything. Now, my son Bradley, when he was two, he really decided that he wanted to try this. And we weren't so sure about it, but we thought, well, let's try it and get it out of his system. Uh, although it kind of backfired on us because he just loved it. He just put it right into his mouth. And this was his first mouse. And he, uh, he just ripped the head right off. And uh, so... I asked him if I asked him if he wanted to spit it out, but uh, he said no. He shoved it further in, and he just started chewing and chewing and chewing. And uh, I said, I said, are you all done? Show me your tongues just to see if it's gone. He sticks his tongue out and he has fur on his tongue, so it was all gone pretty much. So he uh, he got a real appetite that day and. Uh, one time we were back here in the States on furlough and we got them these chicken nuggets from Costco that are shaped like Mickey Mouse. Have you uh -huh. seen those things? Yeah. And he goes, Dad, here they have chicken and it's shaped like a mouse. And in Malawi, we have mice and it tastes like chicken. So <laughs> came up with it all by himself. Um, and what's a mother going to do uh, when his child finishes his food? To give him a big kiss right on the lips. So... That's a little bit about our life in Malawi, just to give you a glimpse and a picture. Please pray for us. We have, uh, we have a number of uh, prayer cards on the very back table there, um, and we also have some newsletters, and there's a sign-up sheet if you would like to sign up and receive. We send out about two or three emails a year just updating people on what's going on. We send out a lot of pictures, and so we do ask that you would pray for us. That's one way you could partner with us and really uh, assist us in the work there and just keep up to date with what's going on. So, again, our prayer cards and the letter and all of that, we'll leave that to you if you would so desire. At this time, I would like to ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. This morning, the title of our message is Grace Greater Than Our Sin. And we're going to be looking at the first three verses of Ephesians, primarily, although we'll be looking in the broader context a little bit, but I'd like to read for you, uh, I'll start reading in Ephesians 2 verse 1, and I'm going to read down through verse 5. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when you were dead in your transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Let's pray. Our Father God, as we come now to the preaching of your word, we ask, Lord, that you would tune our hearts and minds to hear your voice, Lord, that we might grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that you would use this time, Father, to draw people to yourself, and that you, Father, would be glorified here we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I grew up here in Southern California. I was born here in Long Beach at Long Beach Memorial Hospital. I uh, uh, spent most of my young days in Seal Beach where our family lived. And uh, I, uh, I recently was back there and I'm, 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 I'm uh, sometimes reminded of different stories of things I did when I was a kid. And I can't believe now that I'm not a kid anymore because it just seemed like I was never going to grow up to many people. I remember uh, there was one time where I was in Sunday school, in my church Sunday school class, and the pastor, the, the, the children's Sunday school teacher, um, 
uh, I was a very curious child. He had uh, very, very hairy arms, and so I wondered in my mind what would happen if I reached over and twisted his arm hair in the middle of class, and uh, curiosity got the best of me, and so I reached over and twisted his arm hair, and he said, Brian, he said, please go stand outside that door. And uh, I had been told that before. I knew what that meant. So I'm standing outside the Sunday school room door. I'm outside there on 8th Street in Seal Beach. And people are walking by to go to the ocean. And I'm kind of embarrassed because I look like I'm a, a naughty Sunday school kid, which I was. But I didn't like looking like I was. And so I uh, decided, you know, I walked to church this morning. And I usually get home before my parents do anyway. So I'm going to walk home. And then nobody will be the wiser. You know, the Sunday school teacher, I'm out of his hair, and I can just go home, and I'm not in trouble. So I decided to walk across the church grass, and uh, at that time, he decided to come out and talk to me. And when he came out, he saw that I was quite a distance from him, so he yelled, hey, come back here. And so naturally, I ran the opposite direction. I ran away from him, and I ran down to Main Street, Seal Beach. You know, this area here with all the shops and everything, and I'm running in between people. It's a warm summer day, and I, I'm headed towards the beach, and he catches up with me, and he grabs me by the arm, and I never forget how tightly he held my arm, and he, 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 he decided to take a shortcut back to the church, and so he pulled me uh, into an alley. As soon as we started heading towards that alley, I started yelling, help, I don't know this man, help, I don't know this man. <laughs> well, and you will be comforted to know that uh, in our society that a lot of people came and surrounded us and protected me from this man. And uh, it was only a few moments before the police showed up. And uh, they separated us, for which I was grateful, until they asked my story. And so I said, yes, okay, he's my Sunday school teacher, but I don't really want to go back to Sunday school. And they decided that they were going to verify the story with my parents, <laughs> my parents who were in their Sunday school class. And so they put me in the back of the police car black and white patrol car, and they pulled right in front of the church. And then the, the uniformed police officers went into the church to go find my parents in their Sunday school class. And there I was in the back of the police car, and I could look at the church doors, and to me they seemed like they were bulging, like at any minute they were going to open up and the whole congregation was going to come out and see me in the back of a police car. And uh, I, I had a very deep prayer life at that moment, uh, and so I started praying. And I can't tell you exactly what I was praying, but it could have been something along the lines of, Lord, if you get me out of this situation, I promise I'll be a missionary in Africa. <laughs> <sighs> now, the reason why I tell you that story is because invariably, when people hear that story, they say things to me like, boy, when you were a kid, you were a real terror, weren't you? I mean, you were really naughty. And as I come to our text this morning, I think of that because the truth is, I'm much worse than you think I was. I'm much worse than you can imagine from any story you've heard about me. Because I'm someone who was born, according to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, with a heart that is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. And who can understand it? You see, if you were to look at, at my life and you were to say, uh, you know, uh, how much sin has, has permeated my life, I could say that my life has been permeated with sin through and through. And that uh, there's not an area of my life that has not been affected by my sin. I am a sinner. And though we will never understand exactly how deceitful our hearts are, it is beneficial for us to recognize the enormity of our sin, the immensity of our sin, because the more you recognize the magnitude of your sinfulness, the more you will love the one who is able to rescue you from it. That is a, a premise for our message this morning. I'm going to say it again because I think it's important. The more you recognize the magnitude or the immensity of your sinfulness, the more you will love the one who is able to rescue you from it. And I believe this is why Paul speaks so intensely about sin in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. In fact, if you look at the 
opening chapters of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I love the book of Ephesians because it has six chapters and you can divide them up equally with the themes of the chapters. There's three chapters that talk about blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. And there are three chapters, chapters four through six, talk about now live in a manner worthy of the calling by which you've been called. It's talking about holy living and so forth. I mean, in chapter one, you see in verse three, it says that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places of Christ. Verse 5, he starts, you start looking at these blessings. He predestined us. Verse 7, we have redemption. Verse 13, you were sealed with him, in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, you come to Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. God is rich in mercy. He has a great love for which he loved you. Uh, verse Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I would encourage you that if you're having trouble living a holy life and you want motivation for that holy living, that you take a piece of paper and you look at Ephesians chapters 1 through 3 and you read through it verse by verse and you take and you write down every blessing for the believer in Ephesians chapters 1 through 3 because it's blessing after blessing. The whole purpose of Ephesians 1 through 3 is to in a, overwhelm you with the great blessings that are yours in Christ if you are in Christ. Then when you come to Ephesians chapter uh, 4 through 6 where it talks about all the living in a manner worthy of your calling, according to verse 1 of chapter 4, or chapter 5 talks about being imitators of God or being subject to one another, wives to your own husband, husbands to your wives, husbands love your wives, children obey your parents, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, um, be strong in the Lord, put on the full armor of God. In chapters 4 through 6 of Ephesians, you find command after command after command for the believers. And one of the problems we have is we, we sometimes turn to chapters 4 through 6 without keeping in mind what it says in chapters 1 through 3. And we read all the difficult commands of the Bible and we say, how am I going to do that? Because I'm just so not motivated to do that. You need to go back to chapters 1 through 3 where you see that motivation for holy living. And in our text this morning in Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 3, this section about sin is part of the motivation for a holy living because Paul wants you to see that the more you understand the immensity or the greatness or the depth of your sin, the more you understand that, the more you will love the one who is able to forgive you of your sins. And in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3, we find four descriptions of your life prior to Christ redeeming you. Four descriptions of your life, if you're in Christ, prior to Christ redeeming you. If you're not in Christ, this is a description of your life now. Four descriptions of your life, the spiritual bankruptcy in your life. The first description is this in verse 1, your former spiritual condition. Verse 1 describes your former spiritual condition. It says in Ephesians 2 verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So what is your former spiritual condition? It is death. Spiritual death. You were dead. This is a participle here. You could be translated, you were being dead talking about your spiritual condition. It's, it's something very interesting, actually, that goes on in this verse because you right there is the object, but the subject is God. And sometimes when the Greeks wrote, if they wanted to emphasize something, they put it at the very beginning of the sentence because word order in Greek is not as important as it is in English. And so the words at the beginning of the sentence receive the most emphasis. He's trying to point out something. And he says, and you... And then he goes all in all, and you don't find what the main verb is until verse 5. So he goes four verses until he really tells you, and the subject there is God. In verse 4, God made you alive. That's what he's trying to get across in these verses. But he spends three verses just saying, you, you. And he talks about your spiritual condition. You were dead we know he's referring to your spiritual condition because he tells us the location of your deadness or the sphere or the realm of your deadness. He says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Notice that he doesn't say you were dead 
because of your trespasses and sins. That would be something different. He says you're dead in your trespasses and sins. And he says that because spiritually dead people sin because they are spiritually dead. You don't sin the first time and now you are a sinner. See, I, I, I don't become a sinner when I sin. I was born a sinner and that's why I sin. I don't become a liar when I tell my first lie. I am a liar and that's why I lie. I don't become a rebellious child at the moment when I run away from my Sunday school teacher and tell the police that I don't know him. I was born a rebellious child, and that is why I do things like that. In fact, I am by nature a rebel against God, and so is everyone else who is related to Adam. Because the Bible says in Romans 5.19, through one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. You were made a sinner because of Adam's sin and because you inherited Adam's sinful nature and so you have been made a sinner. You are born a sinner. You are not born neutral. You are not born righteous and become unrighteous. You are born a sinner. And according to Ephesians 2.1, prior to the work of Christ in our lives, we are spiritually dead. And the reality is that everyone who comes to faith in Christ, prior to that point, they were all equally dead. It doesn't matter if you had perfect Sunday school attendance as a child, or if you grew up in a home perhaps that didn't know uh, or maybe even cursed God, and where God was blasphemed in your home, or by you. you were bo both people were equally dead prior to the transforming work of Christ in your life. Isn't it funny how sometimes we hear someone's testimony and you hear someone's testimony and they get up and they talk about the debauchery that their life was, was um, typified by before they became to Christ, their sinfulness, and they talk about some of the worst things you can imagine and then they say, and Christ changed my life and we, we praise God for that. And then you hear someone else who comes up and says, well, uh, I, I was nothing like that. And we, we, we tend to think it wasn't as much of a miracle or something. But it surely was. It surely was. Lewis Talbot used to be the pastor of the Church of the Open Door in the 1930s and 40s. And one day, he as a busy, active church, they had two funerals in the same day. One was for a man who had been traveling. He was in Europe, and his body had to be flown back. And so it took quite some time to get his body back, and they had the funeral service on a Saturday morning. And, uh, of course, they couldn't have an open casket service. They had a closed casket service because the decay was so bad in those days because of transportation and time and so forth. The other funeral was for a 19-year-old girl, and it happened that evening. And uh, someone walked by, and they had an open casket service, and she had died the day before. And someone looked at her body and said, oh, it looks like she was just sleeping. Someone else made the comment that though the decay on one body was greater than the decay on the other, they were both equally dead. And the same could be said of spiritually dead people. One person's life might appear to have more decay than another person's spiritual life but they are both equally dead. That's the condition of every person who is not in Christ Jesus. Spiritually, they're dead. It doesn't matter if you say, well, I was born a very spiritual person and I have looked into all kinds of spiritual things. The Bible says, prior to faith in Christ, you were dead. Or if you lived a life where you were totally cursing God and everybody knew you didn't want anything to do with church, prior to coming to life in Christ, you were also dead. That is your spiritual condition. A second description of your life prior to Christ is your former spiritual standards. Your former spiritual standards. Chapter, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 speaks of your sins in which you formerly lived or in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. 
Now, the first thing that might stand out to you as you read Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, is that verse 1 says that you were dead, and verse 2 says you lived. Both past tense. How can that be, that you were dead but living? In fact, um, it also says you were walking. Verse 3 says you lived. Verse 2 says you were walking. So you were a living, walking, dead person. S. Lewis Johnson told the story about a, a, a cemetery in Ayrshire, Scotland. And uh, it was a, a small parish, and somebody had visited that area from out of town, and they had passed away there, and they buried that person in the local cemetery, and years went by, and they came across this, this grave, and nobody in the town knew who that person was who had been buried in their cemetery. And so they were so outraged by this, they were upset that a foreigner would be buried in their graveyard, that they actually wrote a sign and posted a sign in Ayrshire, Scotland, and the sign said this, this graveyard is reserved exclusively for the dead living in this parish. It just doesn't seem make sense to us. How could the dead be living anywhere? But what Paul is saying here is that though they were spiritually dead, those who are prior to coming to faith in Christ, physically they were alive. They were physically alive, and they didn't follow their own standards. And they didn't follow God's standards. The standards that they followed were Satan's. And this is a key thought here because we look at uh, ourselves sometimes we think of ourselves as neutral. Is that, well, I'm not as bad as this other person. I may not be doing everything God wants me to do, but, you know, uh, my standards are, are pretty good. I'm not so bad. Have you heard people say that? I'm, I'm not that bad. I'm a nice guy. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 that there is no one who is good, no, not one. So how could the Bible say, say, no one is good? And we, we, we're confused. We're baffled by this because we come across people who are not Christians at all, and it seems like they're doing very good things. Madonna comes to Malawi. Madonna adopted children from Malawi. Madonna has given lots and lots of money to orphanages in Malawi. And you say, how can that not be a good thing? And we know Madonna is not a Christian, right? She doesn't claim to be a Christian. She claims to be a mixture of Judaism and something else. But how can it be if the Bible says no one is good and we see people who we know are not Christians doing good things? The answer is, is because when God looks at a work like that, that it's not something that is is good in his eyes, purely good, in the sense that what is her motive for doing it? You see, if, if you were very wealthy and you gave a million dollars to an orphanage or something like that, that would benefit. And in, in, in our, from our perspective, we say that's a very good thing. But if you did it for your own self-glory, or to ease your conscience, or to try and appease God's wrath against you, or to make yourself earn your salvation, then from God's perspective, that wasn't a good thing at all. In fact, the only thing that is good is when we do things to glorify Him, and we only do things to glorify Him if we have been redeemed by Him, and we are doing it for His glory and for His name's sake. That's why the Bible could say no one is good, and our standards, our standards do not meet up with His standards. The course of this world it says in verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. You see, what the Bible says is you didn't walk according to his standards. You walked according to the world's standards. And whose standards are the world's standards? It says in verse 2, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. This is a clear reference to Satan. This is a clear reference to Satan. We know this because those who walk according to the course of this world or also walk according to the prince of the power of the air. And, and Satan is someone who's described as a spirit working in the son of disobedience. In fact, in Ephesians 6 verse 12, we have a, a similar description here. It says in Ephesians 6 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the dark powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And that word rulers there is the same word we find 
in verse 2, the prince of the power of the air, a reference to those who are working in the sons of disobedience. In fact, the word working there in the original is energao. We get the word energy from it or energizing. And what he's saying here is that the, the, the one the, who follows the course of the world follows the same course as the one who's energizing people towards disobedience to God. He's motivating people to be disobedient. John chapter 12, verse 31, John chapter 14, verse 30, Jesus refers to Satan as the prince of this world. And you see, people are deceived into thinking that they don't want to follow the Bible's standards. I think a lot of people don't put their faith in Christ because they realize, if I repent of my sins, and if I trust in Christ as Lord, I'm going to have to follow His standards, and His standards are holy and I don't want to follow his standards, which are holy, because I want to follow my own standards. But what they don't realize is what the Bible says, if you don't follow God's standards, you are following Satan's standards. And you, it's not like you can be free from any of those standards. Either you are a slave of Christ or you are a slave to sin and following Satan's standards. In fact, in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, it says, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? So what we've learned from Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 2 so far is not only prior to coming to Christ is your spiritual condition death, but also your spiritual standards are Satan's. A third description of your life before Christ are your, is, a, is a description of your spiritual desires. Your spiritual desires. It says in verse 3, Among them too, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. I'm going to start there. Stop there, because I just want to focus on these spiritual desires, first of all, in verse 3. Do you notice there's a shift between verses 1 and 2 and verse 3? In verse 1, it says, you were dead. In verse 2, it says, you formerly walked. In verse 3, it says, among them, that is the sons of disobedience, we all lived in the lusts of our flesh. You see, Paul has been saying you and you and you, and in verse 3, he changes it to we and our. He includes himself now in the picture. You see, this is significant because in Ephesus, you know, Ephesus is, is modern day Turkey now. Well, it is a, quite a popular city in ancient times because there was one of the the natural or the great wonders of the, uh, one of the top seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a, a, a temple to the goddess Artemis. She was, uh, she was a fertility goddess. She's called Diana in Acts chapter 19. In fact, let me just turn quickly to Acts chapter 19. and We'll read a little bit about what it was like in Ephesus when Paul had visited there. Acts chapter 19, verse 18 says, Many also of those who had believed kept coming and confessing and disclosing their, disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and they began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price and it found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So this is what's going on in, in Ephesians, in Ephesus. Uh, Paul was preaching there. He was there for three years. People were coming to Christ. So many people were coming to Christ and they were coming out of a, a, a practice of witchcraft where they had these magic books and they knew they weren't good. They were, so, they were very valuable. They were worth all kinds of silver. And they could have sold it and given the money to do something for the gospel, but they knew they were so bad that they didn't want them in anybody else's hands. So they took these books and they burned them publicly, even though it was a great cost. Also, in Ephesians chapter... 19 verse 24 it says a man named Demetrius a silversmith verses 24 down to verse 29 a man named Demetrius a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis was bringing no little business to the craftsmen 
And he gathered them together with the workmen, similar of trades, and he said, Men, you know that our prosperity are, are, depends, depends upon this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there a danger that this trade of ours falls into disrepute, but also that the temple of our great goddess Artemis, this is Diana in the Roman name, but it will be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will be even dethroned from her magnificence. When they heard this and were filled with rage, they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed with one accord to a theater, dragging among, along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. It gives us a glimpse into what the Ephesian life was like prior to their worship of Christ in that city. They were so enslaved to idolatrous worship of a fertility goddess with all kinds of evil and immoral practices, and they had magical art books which were ter terribly valuable but terribly wicked. And that described their pagan life prior to coming to Christ. And Paul says to them, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And you formerly lived that way. You formerly walked that way. And then he comes to verse 3 and he says, we. And this is significant because Paul grew up in Judaism, which was the religion of the true God. And Paul grew up in a, in a faith which was worshiping the Yahweh, Yahweh, the one and only true God, the creator God. And he studied under uh, Gamaliel, and he studied in Tarsus, and he studied in Jerusalem, and he talked about his life later on according to legal righteousness. In Philippians 3.6, he said he was considered blameless. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a guy who grew up and lived a life externally. If you were to look at his life according to the law of God, you would say, now there's a good guy. And Paul writes to the Ephesians who grew up totally opposite and had a life of debauchery and idolatry. And he says, you were dead. You were spiritually dead. We. You see, what Paul was saying is that I lived in the lust of my flesh as well. We, we read the phrase lust of our flesh and we normally associate it with sexual immorality which surely was going on in Ephesus. But Paul said, I also lived in the lust of my flesh along with you because Paul's desires were desires of self-glory and self-focus and self-recognition. And they were just as sinful as any other lust of the flesh that displays itself, even though externally you don't see it as much. It's a miracle when anyone becomes made alive spiritually. It's a miracle that a spiritually dead person who is a rebel against God, born a sinner, can be made alive by Christ. It is a miracle. If you are in Christ, it's because God resurrected a spiritually dead person. And it's only by his strength. In fact, in fact, this passage is tied in to Paul's prayer from Ephesians 1.18. Take a look back at Ephesians 1.18 through, through 20. In Ephesians 1.18, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory and the inheritance of the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power. You see the word power there, uh, toward those who believe. And these are in accordance with the working of his strength of his might. He's speaking of God's might. And then verse 20, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places. And then he says, so the God is so powerful, it's demonstrated to us in the fact that he raised, rose Christ from the dead, Ephesians 2, and you were dead. You were spiritually dead. So if you're alive, it's because of God's strength that he has made you alive. And it's because of his grace. It's because of his grace. I had a seminary professor who one time told me, it's so much a miracle that anybody comes to Christ that if you were to go to, if you want to practice evangelism, you could go to a county morgue and you could ask them to open the drawers there 
and preach to corpses. And if anyone sits up and says, yes, I repent of my sins and trust in Christ, it's just as much a miracle that anyone spiritually dead would also turn and trust in Christ. Now, we never took them up on any of those practices. I'm not trying to encourage you to do anything like that. But I just want to point out the fact it is a miracle that any of us could say, God, I repent of my sins. I want to follow you as Lord and Master. I no longer want to be the Lord of my life. I no longer want to be enslaved to sin. But I repent of my sins, and I trust in you as, 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 as God in the flesh, uh, as Christ who came down here and lived a perfect life. Christ was Emmanuel, God with us. Christ lived a perfect life. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And therefore, everyone who sins must die. Christ never sinned. Therefore, he never had to die. Yet he allowed himself to be crucified on a cross as a sacrifice and as a substitution for those who would repent and trust in him by faith. And Romans 4 teaches us that when you have faith in Christ, God from eternity past has taken Christ and his work on the cross and God took your sin and he took it out of your account and Christ paid for it in full and he took Christ's righteousness and he uses the word imputed in Romans chapter 4. He placed it into your account so that when God looks at your life, he doesn't see your sinfulness. He sees Christ's righteousness because you have been made alive. You are now spiritually alive. Your spiritual condition used to be death. Your spiritual standards were worldly and satanic. Your spiritual desires were according to the flesh, not to God's. And now, fourthly, we find in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, your former spiritual relationship. Your former spiritual relationship. Ephesians 2, 3 says, And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Children of wrath. It's a frightening title. You probably read through this passage and maybe thought, oh, that's interesting, but think about these words. By nature, pointing back to that natural heritage we have because of our relationship with Adam. Children, demonstrating a very close relationship. What is the, 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 the closest relationship a child has? The closest relationship a child has is with the parent. The parent looks after the child. The child runs to the parent. There is a, there's a close, intimate relationship between a child and a parent. And yet, when God looks at those who are not in Christ, he describes them not as children of God. He describes them as children of wrath. And the word wrath there is a very graphic word. It means anger. Sometimes the same word, uh, equivalent word, is used in the Old Testament, and it's, it's the same word for nose because it means to snort or to be angry. And this is the most common word in the New Testament to describe anger or wrath. It's frightening because the closest, most intimate relationship you had prior to faith in Christ was with not God's care, but with God's wrath, with his anger towards sin. Ephesians 2.3 tells us that by nature we were children of wrath. Our spiritual condition was death. Our spiritual standards were worldly and satanic. Our spiritual desires were according to fleshly desires. And the closest relationship we knew spiritually was not with God, but was with his wrath. I'd like to close by just reading a portion of a story from Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. I'd like to read verses... 40 through verse 50. What's going on in, in Luke chapter 7 is that there's a story of a woman who anoints Jesus' feet. Do you remember this? Jesus comes into a, a village and there's a Pharisee who invites Jesus to his house. The Pharisee's name is Simon. This is not Simon Peter. This is a different Simon. And Jesus goes to this Pharisee's house. And in those days, there wasn't a whole lot to do for entertainment. And so it was culturally acceptable that if somebody came into town that people were interested in and one person invited them over to their house, other people could come around and sit and watch the meal and listen to the conversation. You see, that cut down on gossip because you could be there and see it and hear it and, you know, and you can, everybody could hear it for themselves and then this person would be off. But that was just socially and culturally acceptable in those days. 
And this, on this occasion, someone came who normally wouldn't come to something like that. She's described as a sinner. And she arrives with an alabaster jar of perfume. And when the Pharisee saw this, he thought to himself, in Luke 7, 39, he thought, if this man were a prophet, he would know who this is and what sort of person this woman who's touching him. And in Luke chapter 7, verse 40, Jesus answered him. I love it that Jesus answered this man who thought, you know, because it proves he's a prophet now. And he said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. He said, a moneylender had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were able to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered him and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Jesus' point was this. If you don't think of yourself as a sinner... If you don't think of yourself as much of a sinner, you're not going to love him very much. Paul taught the same thing. When you understand the depth of your sin, the more you understand it, the more you will, you will glorify and love the one who is able to rescue you. And I plead with you today, if you have not truly repented of your sins, that this day you repent of your sin and you trust in the only one who can, who can cleanse you of your sin, who can wash you of your sin, who can make you spiritually alive. As one hymn writer put it, sin and despair like the sea waves cold threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time together in your word. I thank you, Father, for the fact that you have sent Jesus Christ, who is able to be a sufficient sacrifice for the sins of those who would trust by faith in his work. And I pray, Lord, that you would draw us to yourself and glorify yourself we thank you, Father, for making us alive, those of us who are in Christ, and I pray that we would be more motivated now to holy living for the great work that you've done. And for those who are not in Christ, we pray that you would draw them to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.